Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the August 2022 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of On the Question of National Policy by Lenin from 1914. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this piece was written later than April 6, 1914, first published in 1924 in the journal Proletarskaya Revolutia No. 3, published according to the manuscript. The source is Lenin Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1972, Moscow, Volume 20, pages 217 to 225. Translated by Bernard Isaacs and the late Joe Feinberg, HTML transcription and markup by R. Cymbala, and it's in the public domain at the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive, marxists.org. Thanks to MIA, as usual, for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. So let's get into the audiobook. I wish to deal with our government's policy on the national question. This is one of the most important of the questions that come within the jurisdiction of our Ministry of the Interior. Since the time the Duma last discussed the estimates of this ministry, our ruling classes have been bringing the national question in Russia into the forefront and rendering it more and more acute. The Bylas case attracted the repeated attention of the whole civilized world to Russia and exposed the disgraceful state of affairs in this country. There is not a vestige of legality in Russia. The administration and the police are given a free hand in their wanton and shameless persecution of the Jews, even to the extent of covering up and condoning crimes. This precisely was the upshot of the Bylas case, which revealed the closest and most intimate connection. So, editor's note, here the text trails off, a page of the manuscript is missing. Continuing. To show that I am not exaggerating when I speak of the pogrom atmosphere that Russia is breathing, I can quote the evidence of that most, quote, reliable, most conservative writer, Prince Meshchersky, the, quote, minister maker. Here is the opinion of, quote, a Russian from Kiev, published in Prince Meshchersky's journal, Grajdanin. Footnote there, Grajdanin, or The Citizen, was a reactionary newspaper published in St. Petersburg from 1872 to 1914. From the 80s of the 19th century, it was the organ of the extreme monarchists. It existed largely on government subsidies. Big surprise. From 1906, it appeared as a weekly. Now on to the quote. The atmosphere in which we are living is suffocating. Wherever you go, there is whispering, plotting. Everywhere there is bloodlust. Everywhere the stench of the informer. Everywhere hatred. Everywhere mutterings. Everywhere groans. Unfortunately, the quote is cut off. Another page of the manuscript is missing. The political atmosphere which Russia is breathing. To talk or think about law, legality, a constitution, and similar liberal naivetes in such an atmosphere is simply ridiculous, or rather, it would be ridiculous if it were not so serious. The atmosphere is felt day in, day out by every person in the country who is at all intelligent and observant, but not everyone has the courage to admit the significance of this pogrom atmosphere. Why does such an atmosphere reign in our country? Why is it able to reign? Only because the country is actually in a state of scarcely concealed civil war. Comment. You know, I love reading Lenin <laughs> during this period because everything reminds me of the United States. Obviously at a different stage of development, but the social breakdown is incredible. Anyway, this is between the 1905 First Russian Revolution and the 1917, well there were two revolutions in 1917, in February when the Tsar was overthrown and then in October when the bourgeois provisional government was overthrown. But between 1905 and 1917, there were sort of um, more progressive years or year clusters and more reactionary years and year clusters. So they were going through this time of reaction, police spies everywhere, etc. Continuing, some find it very unpleasant to admit this truth. They would rather put a cloak over it. Our liberals, both the progressists and the cadets, are particularly fond of stitching such a cloak out of patches of almost quite, quote, constitutional theories. But I permit myself to consider that there is nothing more harmful, nothing more criminal, than for representatives of the people to spread edifying deception from the rostrum of the Duma. So footnote there, the Duma was the parliament that was set up as one of the reforms after the 1905 revolution, and the progressists were a political group of the Russian liberal monarchist bourgeoisie which, during the elections to the Duma and within the Duma, 
attempted to unite elements of the various bourgeois landlord parties and groups under the flag of, quote, nonpartisanship. In November 1912, the Progressists formed an independent political party with the following program, a moderate constitution with restricted electoral qualifications, petty reforms, a responsible ministry, i.e. a government accountable to the Duma and suppression of the revolutionary movement. Lenin pointed out that in composition and ideology, the Progressists were a, quote, cross between the Octoberists and cadets, and described the program of the Progressist Party as being a national liberal program. During World War I, the Progressists became more active and demanded a change of military leadership, the gearing of industry to the needs of the front, and a, quote, responsible ministry with the participation of representatives of the Russian bourgeoisie. After the February Bourgeois Democratic Revolution, some of the party's leaders were members of the bourgeois provisional government. After the victory of the Great October Socialist Revolution, the Progressist Party waged an active struggle against the Soviet government. Back to the text. The government's entire policy towards the Jews and other, quote, subject peoples, pardon me for using this government expression, will at once become clear, natural, and inevitable if we face the truth and admit the undoubted fact that the country is in a state of scarcely concealed civil war. The government is not ruling, but is waging war. It chooses, quote, genuinely Russian pogrom methods of warfare because it has no others at its disposal. Everybody defends himself the best he can. Purishkevich and his friends cannot defend themselves otherwise than by pursuing a pogrom policy, but they have no other means. It's no use sighing. It's absurd to try to make shift with talk about a constitution or law or the system of administration. Here, it is simply a matter of the class interests of Purishkevich and company, a matter of the difficult position that this class is in. Either settle accounts with this class resolutely and not merely in word, or else admit that the pogrom atmosphere is inevitable and inescapable in the entire policy of Russia. Either resign yourselves to this policy, or else support the popular mass, and, in the first place, the proletarian movement against it. These are the only alternatives. There can be no middle course here. In Russia, even according to official, i.e. palpably exaggerated statistics, which are faked to suit the government's plans, the Great Russians constitute no more than 43% of the entire population of the country. The Great Russians in Russia constitute less than half the population. Officially, according to Stolopin himself, even the Little Russians, or Ukrainians, are classed as a subject people. Consequently, the subject peoples in Russia constitute 57% of the population, i.e. the majority of the population, almost three-fifths in all probability actually more than three-fifths. In the Duma, I represent Ekaterinoslav Gubernia, the overwhelming majority of whose population are Ukrainians. The ban on the celebrations in honor of the Shevchenko was such an excellent, splendid, exceptionally happy and well-chosen measure as far as anti-government agitation is concerned that no better agitation could be conceived. Footnote there, Taras Shevchenko lived 1814 to 1861, was a great Ukrainian poet, painter, and revolutionary democrat who fought against czarism and serfdom. His works, which are imbued with hatred of the oppressors, reflected the struggle of the revolutionary Ukrainian peasantry and the conditions of life of the Ukrainian people. Back to the text. I think that none of our best social democratic agitators against the government could ever have achieved such sensational success in so short a time as was achieved by this measure in rousing opposition to the government. After this measure was taken, millions upon millions of ordinary people began to be converted into public-minded citizens, and were made to see the truth of the saying that Russia is, quote, a prison of nations. Our parties of the right and our nationalists are now clamoring so vehemently against the Mazepists and our famous Bobrinsky is defending the Ukrainians from the oppression of the Austrian government with such splendid democratic zeal that one would think he wanted to join the Austrian Social Democratic Party. But if by Mazepism is meant gravitation towards Austria and preference for the Austrian political system, then perhaps Bobrinsky will not be one of the least prominent of the Mazepists, for he complains and rants about the oppression of the Ukrainians in Austria. Just think how hard it must be for a Russian-Ukrainian for instance, for an inhabitant of Ekaterinoslav Gubernia, which I represent, to read or hear this. If Bobrinsky himself, if the nationalist Bobrinsky, 
if Count Bobrinsky, if Squire Bobrinsky, if factory owner Bobrinsky, if Bobrinsky, who has links with the highest nobility, almost with the spheres, thinks that the status of the national minorities is unjust and oppressive in Austria, where there is nothing like the disgraceful Jewish Pale of Settlement, or the despicable practice of deporting Jews at the whim of despotic governors, or the prohibition of the native language in schools, then what should be said about Ukrainians in Russia? What should be said about the other subject peoples in Russia? Do not Bobrinsky and the other nationalists, as well as the rights, realize that they are bringing home to the subject peoples in Russia, that is, to three-fifths of the population of Russia, the fact that Russia is a backward country even compared with Austria, which is the most backward of European countries. The whole point is that the position of Russia, which is governed by the Purishkeviches, or rather, groaning under the heel of the Purishkeviches, is so peculiar that the utterances of the nationalist Bobrinsky admirably explain and foment social democratic agitation. Keep it up, noble factory owner and landlord Bobrinsky. You will certainly help us to arouse, enlighten, and stir up both the Austrian and the Russian Ukrainians. In Ekaterinoslav, I heard several Ukrainians say that they wanted to send Count Bobrinsky an address of thanks for his successful propaganda in favor of the Ukraine cessation from Russia. I was not surprised to hear this. I saw propaganda leaflets, on one side of which was the UK's banning the Shevchenko celebrations, while on the other side were excerpts from Bobrinsky's eloquent speeches in favor of the Ukrainians. I advised sending these leaflets to Bobrinsky, Perishkovich, and other ministers. But if Perishkovich and Bobrinsky are superlative agitators in favor of transforming Russia into a democratic republic, our liberals, including the cadets, are trying to conceal from the people their agreement with the Perishkoviches on certain fundamental questions of national policy. I would not be fulfilling my duty if, in speaking on the estimates of the Ministry of the Interior, which is pursuing a national policy everybody is aware of, I did not mention this agreement of the Constitutional Democratic Party with the Ministry of the Interior's principles. Indeed, is it not clear that anybody who wishes to be, putting it mildly, in quote, opposition to the Ministry of the Interior, must also know the ideological allies of this ministry in the cadet camp. According to a wretch report, the Constitutional Democratic Party, or the Party of People's Freedom, held its regular conference in St. Petersburg on March 23rd to 25th of this year. Quote, National questions, says wretch number 83, were discussed in a most lively manner. The deputies from Kiev, who were supported by N.V. Nekrasov and A.M. Kalubakin, stated that the national question was a maturing major factor which had to be met more firmly than it had been up to now. But F.F. F. Kokoshkin said that both the program and previous political experience called for very careful handling of the, quote, elastic formulas of political self-determination for, quote, nationalities, unquote. This is Wretch's version of the matter, and although this version is deliberately worded to keep the greatest numbers of readers in the dark, the gist of the matter is nevertheless very clear to every observant and thinking person. Kievskaya Missile, which sympathizes with the cadets and voices their views, reports Kokoshkin's speech with the addition of the following comment, quote, because it may lead to the disintegration of the state, unquote. There's a footnote there, Kievskaya Missile, or Kiev Thought, was a daily of a bourgeois democratic trend published in Kiev from 1906 to 1948. Until 1915, the paper came out with a weekly illustrated supplement, and from 1917 in two editions, morning and evening. Back to the main text. This undoubtedly was the gist of Kokoshkin's speech. Among the cadets, Kokoshkin's point of view prevailed even over the extremely timid democratism of the Nekrasovs and Kolyubikins. Kokoshkin's point of view is that of the great Russian liberal bourgeois nationalist, who defends the privileges of the great Russians, although they are a minority in Russia, and defends them hand-in-hand hand with the Ministry of the Interior. Kokoshkin, quote, theoretically defended the policy of the Ministry of the Interior. That is the gist, the core of the matter. Quote, more careful handling of political self-determination of nations. Care must be taken that it does not, quote, lead to the disintegration of the state. That is the substance of Kokoshkin's national policy which fully coincides with the main line of policy pursued by the Ministry of the Interior. But Kokoshkin and the other cadet leaders are not infants. They're perfectly familiar with the saying, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. 
The state exists for the people, not the people for the state. Kokoshkin and the other cadet leaders are not infants. They know perfectly well that in our country, the state is, in effect, the Purishkovich class. The integrity of the state is the integrity of the Purishkovich class. If one looks at the essence of their policy, stripped of its diplomatic trappings, one will realize what the Kokoshkins are concerned about. For the sake of illustration, I shall quote the following simple example. In 1905, as you know, Norway seceded from Sweden in face of vehement protests from the Swedish landlords, who threatened to go to war against Norway. Fortunately, the feudalists in Sweden are not all powerful as they are in Russia, and there was no war. Norway, with a minority of the population, seceded from Sweden in a peaceful, democratic, and civilized way, not in the way the feudalists and the militarist party wanted. What happened? Did the people lose by it? Did the interests of civilization, or the interests of democracy, or the interests of the working class, suffer as a result of this secession? Not in the least. Both Norway and Sweden are countries that are far more civilized than Russia is. Incidentally, precisely because they succeeded in applying, in a democratic manner, the formula of the, quote, political self-determination of nations. The breaking of compulsory ties strengthened voluntary economic ties, strengthened cultural intimacy and mutual respect between these two nations, which are so close to each other in language and other things. The common interests, the closeness of the Swedish and Norwegian peoples, actually gained from the secession, for secession meant the rupture of compulsory ties. I hope that this example has made it clear that Kokoschkin and the Constitutional Democratic Party take their stand entirely with the Ministry of the Interior when they try to scare us with the prospect of the, quote, disintegration of the state, and urge us to be, quote, careful in handling an absolutely clear formula, which is accepted without question by the entire international democracy, the, quote, political self-determination of nationalities. We Social Democrats are opposed to all nationalism and advocate democratic centralism. We are opposed to particularism and are convinced that all other things being equal, big states can solve the problems of economic progress and of the struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie far more effectively than small states can. Comment. Remember, he added, all other things being equal. Continuing. But we value only voluntary ties, never compulsory ties. Wherever we see compulsory ties between nations, we, while by no means insisting that every nation must secede, do absolutely and emphatically insist on the right of every nation to political self-determination that is, to secession. To insist upon, to advocate, and to recognize this right is to insist on the equality of nations, to refuse to recognize compulsory ties, to oppose all state privileges for any nation whatsoever, and to cultivate a spirit of complete class solidarity in the workers of the different nations. The class solidarity of the workers of the different nations is strengthened by the substitution of voluntary ties for compulsory, feudalist, and militarist ties. We value most of all the equality of nations in popular liberties and for socialism. And editors note again, unfortunately, another page of the manuscript is missing. So that quote trails off and then we come back in in mid-sentence and insist on the privileges of the great Russians. But we say no privileges for any one nation, complete equality of nations and the unity amalgamation of the workers of all nations. Eighteen years ago, in 1896, the International Congress of Labor and Socialist Organizations in London adopted a resolution on the national question, which indicated the only correct way to work for both real, popular liberties and socialism. The resolution reads, quote, This Congress declares that it stands for the full right of all nations to self-determination, and expresses its sympathy for the workers of every country now suffering under the yoke of military, national, or other absolutism. This Congress calls upon the workers of all these countries to join the ranks of the class-conscious workers of the whole world in order jointly to fight for the defeat of international capitalism and for the achievement of the aims of international social democracy." Unquote. And we, too, call for unity in the ranks of the workers of all nations in Russia, for only such unity can guarantee the equality of nations and popular liberties and safeguard the interests of socialism. The year 1905 united the workers of all nations in Russia. 
The reactionaries are trying to foment national enmity. The liberal bourgeoisie of all nations, first and foremost the great Russian bourgeoisie, is fighting for the privileges of its own nation. For example, the Polish Kolo is opposed to equal rights for Jews in Poland, is fighting for national segregation, for national exclusiveness, and is thereby promoting the policy of our Ministry of the Interior. Footnote there, the Polish Kolo was an association of Polish deputies in the Duma. The leading core of this association in the first and second Dumas were the National Democrats, members of the reactionary Nationalist Party of Polish landlords and bourgeoisie. On all basic questions of Duma tactics, the Polish Kolo supported the Octoberists. Back to the text. A true democracy, headed by the working class, holds aloft the banner of complete equality of nations and of unity of the workers of all nations in their class struggle. From this point of view, we reject so-called cultural national autonomy, that is, the division of educational affairs in a given state according to nationality, or the proposal that education should be taken out of the hands of the state and transferred to separately organized national associations. A democratic state must grant autonomy to its various regions, especially to regions with mixed populations. This form of autonomy in no way contradicts democratic centralism. On the contrary, it is only through regional autonomy that genuine democratic centralism is possible in a large state with a mixed population. A democratic state is bound to grant complete freedom for the native languages and null all privileges for any one language. A democratic state will not permit the oppression or the overriding of any one nationality by another, either in any particular region or in any branch of public affairs. But to take education out of the hands of the state, and to divide it according to nationality among separately organized national associations is harmful from the point of view of democracy, and still more harmful from the point of view of the proletariat. This would merely serve to perpetuate the segregation of nations, whereas we must strive to unite them. It would lead to the growth of chauvinism, whereas we must strive to unite the workers of all nations as closely as possible, strive to unite them for a joint struggle against all chauvinism, against all national exclusiveness, against all nationalism. The workers of all nations have but one educational policy, freedom for the native language and democratic and secular education. I conclude by expressing my gratitude once again to Purishkovich, Markov II, and Bobrinsky for their effective agitation against the entire political system in Russia, for the object lessons they have given, which prove that Russia's transformation into a democratic republic is inevitable. That's the end of the audiobook. Gotta say, I like this one a lot. I think it was pretty clear as well. The only thing is some of the names, if you're not real familiar with this time period, you might not have known who Purishkovich was, etc. I'll put some links to just like wiki articles on these people uh, in case you want to read up on some of that. If you listen to or read a lot of Lenin, a lot of these names uh, appear regularly. Anyway, what do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion in the comments section as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link in the description. We don't run ads or sponsorships on the channel, so that support is vital, and it's allowed me to spend a lot more time on this channel producing content than I would have been able to do without it. So if you like this, thank a patron and consider becoming one yourself. Beyond that, once the content is created and uploaded, engagement counts, so liking, sharing, subscribing, and leaving comments, even if it's just thanks or good video, all of that helps to build the channel and helps to encourage YouTube to recommend this content to more and more people. The channel has been growing by about five or 600 per month recently, and we'd love to see it continue to expand. Thanks again for listening, keep up the struggle where you live, and we'll see you in the next video.